Just about everyone who plays RPGs has at least one heart-pulling game by Square Enix. Whether it be Chrono Trigger, Star Ocean, Dragon Quest, or more likely than anything else, one of the numbered Final Fantasy titles. No RPG series with such varied installments is as well loved as the Final Fantasy series. Just about every game is a drastic departure from the game before it, whether it be in its story, world, gameplay, and in most cases, all three of those. This meant that if someone has a particular distaste for, say, Final Fantasy IV, there's still a chance they can roll over and find a love for Final Fantasy VIII. That might sound kinda neat, but the drastic changes between games also came at the risk of older fans becoming alienated with each new installment. This wasn't a case of Square trying to be different. RPG series just normally leave their previous casts and worlds alone since their stories are typically over. Having a player sink 30 to 40 hours into a game only to have a horrible cliffhanger ending would make a player feel cheated. For this reason, Squaresoft always tried to make all of their products feel complete by the end. Almost every RPG series in the 90s and even today do this. Shin Megami Tensei, Dragon Quest, Wild Arms, Disgaea, Atelier, and really just about anything that isn't Ease ditches their previous cast and, in many series, the entire worlds from the previous titles. What keeps most series together is their enemies, story tropes, and most importantly, gameplay. I know this topic is a little deeper, but where I'm trying to head towards is that Final Fantasy X-2 changed the landscape for Square Enix. The world players thought was done and over had a continuation that respected its predecessor's story and themes, while also going off and doing its own thing. And by own thing, <laughs> I mean instead of being a somber isekai with anti-organized religion elements and a gameplay similar to Final Fantasy VII, it became Charlie's Angels with a sexier version of Final Fantasy V's job system. The quality of X-2 is something I'm not going to touch on today, but by sales numbers it was an unprecedented success. In fact, it was such a success that Square Enix decided to revisit older FF titles. Final Fantasy VII got three spin-off games, an OVA, and a movie. Final Fantasy III and IV got 3D remakes, plus Final Fantasy IV got a sequel done by the same people who did all those crappy Disney sequels. But the most impressive project came from the Ivalice Alliance, which took the setting of Final Fantasy Tactics and then advanced it over one and a half more Tactics titles, a non-Final Fantasy game called Vagrant Story, and most importantly, the numbered title of Final Fantasy XII. And after the success of this, Square Enix saw the potential in developing titles from the start with major connections. This idea led to the conception of the Fabula Nova Crystallis Final Fantasy with Final Fantasy XIII, Aegido XIII, and Versus XIII. All three of these titles began development at the same time by three different teams that didn't really communicate well with each other. This lack of communication was exacerbated by the plan to have all of those games run on the new Crystal Engine. The Crystal Engine was meant to be a new in-house game creation tool that Square Enix hoped could be used on a majority of future titles. But... It turned out to be a problematic piece of tech that was only used for the 13 series. These two problems, paired with a lack of a shared vision for a majority of development, are the main reasons that led to all of these titles being delayed significantly. But there was one more red flag for Aguido and Versus. Final Fantasy XIII released with some of the most negative fan reception a main series Final Fantasy had ever had. Mind you, that more means it had a passable rating instead of Masterpiece, like expected of the series. But, a few months later, the NIGHTMARE Final Fantasy XIV released to absolutely scathing reviews from fans and critics. These two titles releasing within half a year of each other in North America forced the Final Fantasy brand to hit its low point in history. But even worse than the FF brand, the XIII brand was no longer a safe idea for Aguido or Versus. Aguido still released the next year as a Japanese exclusive on PSP under the title of Type-0 to distance itself from 13, although it still retained its connections to 13 and the FNC. Versus 13, however, entered a string of development problems that caused it to stray far enough from 13 that it was renamed 15, and its place in the FNC is debated. I still haven't played 15 yet since I was waiting for all the DLC to come out, and I've also stayed surprisingly spoiler-free, so I'm not going to throw my hat into that ring today. But the main point of this is, 
The original idea for the FNC strayed so far from its original idea that the original point of it became muddled. But it wasn't because of Type 0 or 15. The true culprit of this comes from Final Fantasy 13 2 and Lightning Returns Final Fantasy 13. This is gonna be so much fun! Given how I just went into how Final Fantasy XIII became a marketing taboo, you're probably wondering how it got two direct sequels. Well, first and most obvious reason is that Final Fantasy XIII was still the fourth best-selling mainline FF game. This meant Square saw potential in having sequels since they'd get potential earnings. On top of that, critic reviews were overwhelmingly positive at the time. And there's also this brief denial period on the quality of XIII-1 by regular folk. A lot of people didn't want to admit that Final Fantasy XIII wasn't a masterpiece. Nowadays, most people agree 13 is competent, it's not Sonic 06 or Big Rigs, but it's not on the same quality as Final Fantasies 4 through 12. This meant a lot of people still want to say it was the same quality as Final Fantasy 5 or 8, but then a few people started pointing out flaws, mainly the fact that the game is linear enough to play with DK bongos, and then it became like when a child first realizes adults lie and people began exaggerating the game's flaws. A decade after its Japanese release, here in God's Year 2019, a sizable number of people are starting to give 13 the second chance it deserves, and because of this I don't feel like getting on the same trampoline as everyone else. Today I'd just like to talk about 13-2 and Lightning Returns. In terms of story, I am going to bring up 13-1 a lot for comparison's sake, but there's a lot I want to talk about with 13-2 and a fucking shit ton with Lightning Returns. Into the heat of battle. Go for it! So while I do think 13-1 has a significantly superior story and cast, 13-2 has the upper hand in just about every other aspect. First is the battle system that has been refined in almost every way possible. 13-2 has two main playable characters. There's Lightning's younger sister, Styrofoam, and Null, a boy from the future who has the same voice actor as Max Goof. But if I had to pick a favorite, it'd be Adamantus if I can get it. Well, there they are, help yourself. Which makes me wonder why Nomura hasn't put either of them in Kingdom Hearts yet. Both of the main characters can have almost every paradigm on them by the end of the first act if the player wishes. I wouldn't recommend this, but it is an option. The two of them also learn different skills on each class, so there's still merit to not just giving three classes to Styrofoam and three to Null. Some other improvements include the ability to switch the party leader mid-battle and automatically switch into the second character when the first one dies, which is a much needed improvement. The removal of the water and earth element, because 13-1 became redundant with the amount of elements, the ability to strike an enemy on the map to earn a preemptive encounter instead of trying to sneak up on them in 13-1, this fucking sucked. Faster transitions between the overworld and battle scenes, manual jumping anywhere, which adds a layer of creativity to the maps, and a general increased speed throughout the whole battle system. As well as that, for a good world building tool and a break from the usual running in battles, 13-2 brings back a multitude of minigames, which 13 lacked completely. Our most prominent minigames come from these orange crystal pillars that transport you to a time outside of time, where you need to solve one to five of a few different types of puzzles. Most of them aren't too difficult, but there's this one stupid fucking clock minigame that just takes too long and really just use this online solver I found. It's... it's not worth the trouble, really. You can also eventually go to a casino that lets you play a fairly standard slots minigame, but if you bought the Zaz DLC, you can play Texas Hold'em and this turbo-addictive and original minigame that has more rules than I have time to describe. I actually ended up playing this one for like three hours, I just turned on a podcast, kept going and going, and it's a great way to get all the items here. There's also Chocobo Racing, but it's more complicated than the one in 7, and it's not mandatory to get anything, so I just gave up. The last bit of minigames I recall are a series of quiz terminals that can be found in one of the locations. Questions aren't atrociously difficult, but many are based upon data log entries from both games, so you'll have the advantage if you've done that. Moving to some gameplay changes that I wouldn't call completely improvements include a Pokemon S monster catching mechanic that replaces the third party member, and the removal of the technical points meter and skills. I don't have strong opinions on either of these two changes, so we'll leave it at that, but they're also big enough changes where I'd look foolish to ignore them. What I do want to stress about the Pokemon thing is that once you find the Silver Chocobo, recruit it immediately. You can't do it till near the end, but you'll be happy you did. It's one of the most useful ones. Personally, I used whatever the best medic and commando I could find with Zaz, Hugh, and Luck after doing his DLC. Although, I did later realize that this was a mistake, because Null actually has a really good medic roll, and that was the last thing I unlocked for him, so whoops, fuck, I'll try better next time, I guess. 
So of course an improved battle system is nice and all, but what really improved 13.2 compared to the first is the return of town, side quests, and freely explorable maps. A little analogy for comparison to 13.1. So 13.1 started by holding the player's hand during the first 30 hours of gameplay. Then, for about 10, it lost you at the toy store. Then, another 10 hours spent trying to shove you back in the car to get home. 13.2 nicely helps you cross the street, because you're too short for cars to see you, but it lets you do it at your own pace. Gives you a list of things you need to do, and another list of fun things you can do, but only if you want to. Gives you a little pat on the back, kisses you on the forehead, then lets you take your time so that you can stare at as much HD Chocobo Cloaca as you want. Once all is said and done and you're as happy as can be, nothing can go wrong, you come home, learn that mom and dad are getting divorced. Let's talk about the story of 13-2. Now is that a polite way to greet old friends? 13-2 <laughs> takes place three years after the ending of 13, but also, no, because 13-2 immediately retcons the ending of 13. Nice work, buddy. 13 originally ended with the whole gang stopping the evil Pope stand-in, Bang and Vanille being crystallized to stop Cocoon from falling, Snow and Lightning finally reuniting with Styrofoam while Zaz reunited with his son, and Hope stopped being moody because he realized he had a chance to fuck famous Louis Vuitton model Lightning Farron. 13-2 changed this so that in the very fucking middle of the ending, Lightning was swept away to Valhalla to fight the main villain of 13-2, Caius, over and over again, until one of them finally gives up. With the exception of Styrofoam, everyone believes that Lightning just became part of the pillar with Fang and Vanille. This major retcon is the biggest through line that ruins the story of 13-2 and Lightning Returns. Because of this, the sequels to 13 don't create a consistent trilogy, it's an Elseworlds tale given a 70 hour story. You can debate about whether the radical shift in tone that 10-2 took was warranted all you want, but at least it didn't change the pre-established ending of 10. Changing the previous ending shows a lack of faith in the previously established story, and I am grasping for straws a bit here, but... 13-2 and Lightning Returns working their plot off a of retcon does have the added benefit of meaning that you can just play 13 and still feel satisfied knowing that you're done with the story. But it also wouldn't shock me if the three titles are packaged together in the future like 10 and 10-2 are today. Unnaturally shifting back to the story, Noel and his Moogle Mog come to the present and they convince Styrofoam to go time hopping with them so they can save Lightning and also find Caius, who's later revealed to have been a mentor to Noel. All of the main story quest between this point and the end is just trying to find Caius who's fucking with the time stream and also saving Lightning and Yule. For brevity's sake, I'm just going to say that Yule is a constantly reincarnated oracle who has strong emotional ties to Noel and Caius. 13-2's main story mostly exists to get you from one cool time and place to the next cool time and place. The real meat of the game comes from the side quests in each area and that sweet, sweet feeling of getting a 100% in a given location. Actually, it might be easier to describe the structure of the game as closer to a collectathon like Tie the Tasmanian Tiger or Banjo Kazooie than a traditional RPG. Hear me out on this. You have a big level selection area, multiple large fields that you can go through at your own pace, and a checklist of what all is left in a selected area. Sounds pretty collectathon y to me. Uh -huh. You'll find some of the characters from 13.1 in a few of these areas, and by that, I mean you'll find hope. For everyone else, uh, snow appears one time. Zaz is in the DLC. Oh, and Vanilla and Fang show up as Obi-Wan ghosts who come to give Star from a quick pep talk when she's being all moody and shit. Use the force, Luke. With all that out of the way, let's talk about 13-2's ending. Nolan Styrofoam have finally tracked down Kaisa in an alternate 500 AD where a new cocoon is going to be erected since the old one is destined to fall. Kaius here has come to this era because he plans to force both cocoons to fall so that he can end his immortality that I didn't mention earlier. Meanwhile, Nolan and Styrofoam have to stop him. The scenario in Kaius's plan is actually hinted at since around the middle of the game to make it progress fairly smoothly. The final dungeon itself ramps up the difficulty to a level that's pretty annoying, but I also ignored the shop at the start of the dungeon that just so happened to be selling significantly stronger weapons, so that's probably my bad. But hey, I also bought Echo Jr. after hating Echo the Dolphin, so maybe I'm not the right guy to ask when it comes to anything purchase related. Anyways, our heroes make it to Caius where they have a fight with him and Bahamut in what is a really tough final boss if you don't grind beforehand. At the end, Caius begs Noel to kill him so that he and Yul's curse could be over and it makes it look like it's a choice, but it's also really not because he dies either way, so Noel kills him. Then after that, the two heroes go back to the new safe cocoon in the year 500 AF to live their lives in peace. 
Thank you. Sarah. No, not now, please. Sarah, snap out of it. No! No. Sarah. But, haha, -ha, LMAO, just kidding. Styrofoam dies and the happy music continues and, oof. Ooh, God, this is, this doesn't match very much. As well as this, a giant black hole allows darkness to start to ruin the land. Everyone is now doomed and lightning has turned herself to crystal in Valhalla. You just spent 35 to 40 hours just to get punched in the mouth and watch your dog get kicked in the tit. This is the canon ending to the game. So that means 13-2 not only retcons 13-1's ending, but doesn't even bother to have a proper conclusion itself. This means that essentially the whole point of 13-2's story was to set up Lightning Returns Final Fantasy 13. Yeah, I've been waiting for this! So first thing I want to get into about the game, I have no physical proof that the game actually exists. I went into stores and never saw it, even when it was a new game, it was not on the shelf. And then when I asked my friends about it, they have not seen it either. So a few months ago when I decided to finally buy the game on Amazon, I ordered it like new, and here it is in a tiny little pack and oh look at that, no case. Because of this I decided to have it share a case with its big sister 13 too, but honestly after beating it, I think it did deserve that bitch baby sleeve. Please. Please stop talking. So Lightning Returns began development about as soon as 13.2 ended and released two years after the game and it returned us to playing as Lightning. So you know, at least they're upfront about the whole ordeal, but I am a whiny bitch, so I do have a problem with this I'll get to soon. Lightning wakes up from her slumber 500 years after the events of 13.2 to find that everyone stopped aging, no one is capable of breeding, the world is going to end in 13 days, and she has been selected as the savior to save people's poor souls so they can be carried over to the next world. Lightning complies with doing this because the literal god, Boon of Elza, told her that this is her destiny. As a setup for a singular game, this would have been great, but, as a setup for a 13 sequel, especially as a follow-through of Lightning as a character, it's actually kind of insulting. So, first little issue here is the fact that Lightning is now the chosen warrior destined for greatness, when her characterization in the first game was just an angry mercenary that wanted to save her sister and not die. There was nothing truly grand about her, and even in that game it's debatable if she's even really the main character. She was given a fate by a god, but it was metaphorical instead of literal. Sure, the metaphor was clubbed into your head like a seal laid on his alimony, but it kept the world grounded and had more of a lesson than a situation. And also, since it was a lesson that Lightning learned in 13.1, why would she need to learn it again? Lightning and Hope, who is de-aged to a teenager in Lightning's Navigator, have been wiped of their emotions, but they still have their memories. Lightning has no reason to think that following a being of a higher power is a good idea. Make sure you keep this point in your head, because it will be really relevant once we reach the end. Well, I got the picture. Shifting over to the game's structure, if Final Fantasy XIII was a Six Flags line and XIII-2 was a collectathon, then Lightning Returns is closest to an American sandbox game, like Infamous or Spider-Man. Throughout the game, you're given five main quests that need to be completed in whatever order you want, and a fucking shit ton of side quests and guild quests that Chocolina gives you. Finishing each quest is also how you save poor souls to bring them to the next world, so any quest you don't complete means you just let someone fucking die forever. Maybe, we'll get back to this. However, if someone dies like a normal person, they are sent to what is essentially the Shadow Realm, which we'll get back to once we talk about the game's ending. The game's five main quests are all related to a certain character from previous titles. There's one for Null, Snow, Fang, Zaz, and one shared by Caius and Yule. Our quest list gives a number to each of them to guide you in what order you want, but it's not necessary to follow it. The basic rule for each is that there's one main quest in each of the four locations, except for Zaz, which is a fetch quest spread across all of them. The four locations are Dead Dunes, an empty desert that is too fucking big, Jesus Christ. The Wildlands, which is a giant field that also suffers from size, but you eventually get a chocobo to speed everything up. And there's the party city Yuznan, which is somewhat like an eternal Rio de Janeiro carnival, but it also has a coliseum at the side and a 
landfill that I went to a total of one time. The final and main area is Luxurian, which is the most dense location and is meant to be a gothic city somewhat inspired by Paris, but I got some more Spanish vibes in a lot of areas. Luxurian is also controlled by the religious organization known as the Order of Salvation, who act as somewhat of a villain, I guess? Their alignment is comparable to the actual Catholic Church. It's clear that they had a lot of creative ideas for Luxurian to make it look and feel original, but the rest of the area seem as though they gave up at the midway point. I don't want to dismiss them as horrible since there's a lot that I do like. For example, the main parade area in Yuznan or the Mughal Forest in the Wildlands, but it feels as though they threw things around to where it would make at least a minimal amount of sense and didn't tailor these sections to seamlessly cohere with the rest of the map. Dead Dunes is somewhat coherent, but it's also empty, boring, large, and most random encounters aren't leveled properly to fight with lightning alone, which I guess is a good time to talk about gameplay now. Unlike 13.2, which focuses on refining the problems with 13.1's gameplay, Lightning Returns takes a few of the same parts from the previous titles and puts them into a different frame. The first difference that I mentioned a little earlier is the lack of a party. About 90% of the game is spent with only Lightning. Fang joins during part of her story quest, and the Chocobo mentioned earlier joins while you're in the Wildlands once you finish his quest, but you can't customize either of them at all. Instead of extra party members, Lightning has the Skamata system, which is most easily described as is a mix between the Dress Fear system in 10-2 and the regular 13 battle system, but also that doesn't work, which is why this is a 48 minute sized video. You can have three different costumes equipped to lightning at a time, and you can switch freely between them using the shoulder buttons, with four actions mapped to each of the face buttons to total out to 12 different actions in a set. Most of the costumes are going to have actions locked into them, so if you're using, say, the Midnight Mauve, then you always have Fear equipped to the triangle button. You can also freely pick which outfit Lightning wears on the map. So I chose whatever was the sexiest with the cowboy hat. There's four different types of actions. Physical attack, defense, attack magic, and status ailments. There's no status buffs or healing moves apart from Mediguard, which isn't all that reliable in most cases. The no healing moves is real noticeable since Lightning doesn't heal between battles like 13-1 and 2. Now another change, instead of having either the traditional 1 attack per ATB meter or the ATB charges from the previous two 13 games, Lightning Returns uses a big numbered ATB gauge that changes in size by various factors. Each attack has a certain ATB usage attached to it like previous 13 games, but the usage cost is also variable depending on your equipment. As well as this, each of the three Skamata have their own ATB gauge that will grow faster if you switch to one of the other two. The biggest positive I can give to this game is in its speed. If 13-1 is Jay Garrick and 13-2 is Barry Allen, then Lightning Returns is Wally West. You have no moments to stop if you want to come out of each fight with as little damage as possible. Even timing your blocks properly have an effect on an enemy's stagger meter, which you can compare this to Paper Mario if you need a reference. What? There are going to be some moments during bosses that all three of your ATB meters will run out, but in these cases it's usually helpful to have at least one low cost move that you can spam. Even outside of battle, the game speeds up just a few steps below platform with how fast Lightning runs, how fluently she jumps, and how she can scale and interact with many obstacles. Now just to round out the rest of our HUD, since we've already touched upon here, 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 and there, let's talk about this large circle in the corner. This here is called the EP meter. It's somewhat of a replacement of the TP meter from 13, but it also has significantly different uses. The EP gauge, which stands for energy points because of fucking course, has a multitude of uses in and outside of battle. In battle, you have physical attacks like Quake for hordes and an army of one for bosses, Kiraga, Esunada, and Arise for healing, decoy to distract enemies and overclock to slow down all enemies and reset all your ATB gauges. Of all the in-battle uses, you'll probably want to save them for Kiraga and Overclock, because Kiraga is your only chance to heal outside of your limited items, and Overclock is very, very, very useful because it stops everything. As well as those, you can also escape in a battle for no EP cost, but you do lose one in-game hour, which is a big thing that we'll talk about when I get around to the in-game clock. Outside of battle, you have Teleport, which can take you to select areas after you've been to them once, but it comes at a rather steep price, and Chronostasis that stops the in-game clock for a set amount of time for a fairly small price. Which I figure this is as good a time as any to get into the in-game clock, so let's do that. I fucking hate this thing. A lot. I want to murder it. As mentioned before, the world is going to end in 13 days. Instead of each of the days ending by story progression, you have an in-game clock that decides when it's all over. 
Each day has 24 in-game hours that progress when you are not in a menu, battle, or cutscene. One full day is supposed to clock in at one real hour, but since you'll be talking to people, changing equipment, fighting random encounters, and more than likely using chronostasis, each day is probably going to be closer to two to four hours. As far as finishing the main story quest, you have more than enough time to get that done, but not as much for all the side quests. So early in the game, Hope gives you a warning that you can't save everyone, which makes most players realize they need to make some sacrifices here and there. Now I'm sure a speedrunner could probably get every quest on their third or fourth try, but that's not going to be the case for most people. But here's the thing, if this were a normal RPG, the inability to do everything on the first try might not be too important. But Lightning Returns is feeling rebellious Stupid it, little cocksucker. and decide that instead of improving stats through the traditional experience and level system, you improve certain stats depending on the quest you just finished. So yes, this does mean you can play the game while only doing the main quests, but you'll also be severely underleveled and probably incapable of finishing many of the main quests in the first place. Added on to that, there are some quests that need to be done at a specific time of day or before a certain date. I personally didn't encounter too many failable quests, or at least ones that I failed, but the specific time quests are going to get annoying when you miss an opportunity for something one day and have to wait for the next. If you have good time management, then you should be able to get a lot done, but you need really fucking high stats for the final boss in normal mode, so you can't waste this time. The most annoying part about this means that you have to win every battle. If you lose, you can either escape and lose an hour, or go to the title screen. Since Lightning Returns went back to the traditional no healing between fights, every encounter becomes a struggle for perfection. You might think I'm exaggerating, but I ran for maybe four fights in the whole game and I thought I was pretty tough, so I decided to just skip day 12 through the end system and decided to go fight the final boss. Uh, it turned out I barely had enough power to beat the final boss, which is something we'll get to at the end. Chocobo, it's time to tell! What are the magic words? I don't have a choice, do I? Uh, meow, meow, choco chow. Yee! That was adorable! Here, this is for you! Oh, shit! So as I stated earlier, side quests are your sole form of character growth and are also what you'll be doing for a majority of your playthrough. Now you might think that this means that they'd put a focus on having a large amount of endearing side quests, but in my opinion at least, a lot of them are lacking. About 90% of the quests are just find item, kill enemy, return item, talk to person, and they more often than not fail to feel coherent with the world of Nova Chrysalia. Now, the other 10% that don't feel like chores are bogged down significantly by them just consisting of talking heads with the same character models as everyone else. Really, I think it would have been wiser of the LR team to have scaled back on the amount of quests so they would feel more realistic to complete all the non-failable quests in one go. Given some previous interviews, I think the way side quests were handled was actually done closer to the end of development, which might explain some of the rush feeling areas. They made it sound like it was supposed to be closer to Majora's Mask, where you can get a shit ton done, but you also have the added advantage of going back and forth all the time. And honestly, I think a rewind feature or a special rare item that lets you reset that day would have been handy. I guess you could also just have multiple save files, but if you're a player like myself who never thinks about that, then you're gonna run into some points where you fuck yourself over royally by losing Losing a chance at a quest. Now the first main quest you're supposed to do is Knowles, which is why there's a big ol' number one next to it. Luckily though, I've been up to date on my dumb bitch pills, so I ended up going for Snow first. Now, Snow's been handling the death of his fiance pretty rough. This predicament brought Snow to the same thought every distraught young man has. We should buy a nightclub. Of course we should buy a nightclub. We should totally buy a nightclub. However, he stays secluded in his palace like a mopey molly, which means Lightning needs to go in there and convince him to follow her to the next world where therapy will be less expensive. So about 80% of this questline is spent finding shit around town to throw a banger while Snow just isn't seen at all. Then, once you do meet up with Snow, he makes Lightning fight him because of something that wasn't his fault from 500 years ago. Then after being defeated in battle, Snow decides, oh yeah, you're right Lightning. I really was being a mopey molly, and then just decides, alright, let's go! New world, oh wait, you did this first, you gotta wait another 10 days. 
here's the thing. I get that it's been 500 years since 13.2, but Snow feels very out of character. I don't get the impression that I'm returning to Snow's story, just that I've reached an emotional obstacle for Lightning. Sure, it's still big buff boy with bleached hair, but I don't recognize him as Snow anymore, which makes me not really care about him in this game. And then, after he finishes his story, he just disappears. You don't see him helping to save people in Yuznan or doing anything until the ending, which, again, feels out of character for someone who was characterized as a hero type in the past games. It could have made the world feel more alive if he was at least seen doing construction or something after his quest ended. So the second quest I went after was Null's, which is mostly tied around the idea that the Savior must die. Most of this quest line more so revolves around the church attempting to kill the Savior, but all they know is that she's a woman with rose-colored hair, which, man, there's a lot of those in anime, don't you know? Although, instead of sleuthing more info, they decide to take the baby Moses route and kill one of anyone who fits that description every night. This problem causes fear in the city, and Lightning feels the responsibility to stop it since she is the actual savior. Because of this, Lightning sets out to investigate the ordeal. While she is doing so, a mysterious man is shown following her, but they don't really hide that it's Null. Then, once you find the clergy folk that are causing the issue, and I want to stress, it takes a very long time to find them because of some stupid cryptic shit. Shit. Null appears and reveals that they're trying to kill the Savior because there is a prophecy that says Null will kill the Savior. Why don't you just wait for Null to do it, but I digress. So Null and Lightning work together to stop the clergy, and then he tells her to meet him later for a duel. Of course the duel ends with Lightning winning because that's how video games work, but Null starts to mention how after he failed to save Styrofoam and Yule, couldn't live with himself. Instead of being a bitchy fishy like Snow though, he decided to do the best he could for others while also becoming even more gullible because it's then revealed that the prophecy he saw was a fate created by Lumina. Oh, by the way, Lumina is a girl who looks like Styrofoam, appears every once in a while to be a bitch to lightning and say confusing stuff, but there's no explanation to who she is until after the final boss so we'll come back to it later. So Null's overall story is better than Snow's, but it doesn't feel satisfying to finish? So Null can at least be found around town after his story, and once his story ends, he gives Lightning a hint to go to the cathedral to find Vanille. Which, Vanille doesn't have her own story, she's gonna be at the end, but Vanille has been worshipped by the church as their saint for the past few years and kept under lock so she can't leave. It's not important to Null's story, but I might as well mention it now. Overall, I think Null's story makes sense within the context of what we know about him, but it somewhat upsets me how much we don't get to see. Given the 500 year gap and Null being my favorite of the main characters from the first two games, it almost makes me wish that the game started him instead. Now, to be fair, I'll count this as a personal problem instead of one against the game itself, but I'm just throwing it out there. In this quest, we learn that Fang has become the leader of a gang of bandits in the Dead Dunes. That means instead of going around a city like the past two, Fang's quest mostly takes place in an underground dungeon that is really confusing and I didn't have a lot of fun in this place. The problem is that everything looks too samey and depending on the hour of the day, the doors will open and close, which means that if you get stuck, you have to wait an hour, or if you're lucky, there's an enemy so you can go run from a fight, but it's not fun and it's intrusive and I don't like it. There are some warp points, but they're not a lot of help because you'll warp to a specific spot and you'll realize, oh shit, how do I get here to there? The map is no fucking help. So as mentioned earlier, Fang does join you, which is nice, but you have no control or directive on what she does. Instead of making me feel, oh yeah, I get to reunite with Fang like in 13.1, I just think, wow. I could be playing a different FF game right now. There's a few sections in the dungeon that reveal some history about the gods of the FNC universe, but similar to the feelings I shared earlier, it comes off as somewhat missing the point of the original game's message. Continuing through to the end of the dungeon, you find out that Fang has been searching for an item that the church wants Vanille to use to save the souls of those who had already passed. But actually, it doesn't save those souls, it just wipes them out for eternity. And it'll kill Vanille in the process. Once you find the sacred items, it turns out that Lumina, being the cheeky brat she is, decided to tip off the church on our plans and they attack us. At the end of the fight, the church gets away and there's nothing Lightning can do about this until the final day. Plot-wise, this is the most important of the main quests, but it also has the least enjoyable area to be in because the Dead Dunes is not fun. Next one I did was Zaz's quest. Zaz got fucking shafted. And I'm pretty sure the developers forgot about him until a month before release. 
His story is about his son, Dodge, who's fallen into a coma for the past few hundred years. Because of that, Zaz has been reclusive and has only interacted with Lumina for the past few centuries. Now Lumina, as I said, cheeky bitch, told Zaz that if he can find Dodge's five missing personality traits, then he will wake up. What this actually means is that Lightning has to do it, because that's how this game works. None of them are outrageously difficult to obtain, but there's not much weight or reason to why most of them are at the places they're at. Here's one at the Coliseum. Here's one behind this pillar and the dead dude, and here's another with this shady fellow looking mellow. It's as though they went down the list of major characters and when they got to Zaz, they remembered, fuck, that's right. Oh jeez, what do we do? Ah, oh, he had a good story that ended in 13-1. At the end, Dodge wakes up, Zaz is happy, Lightning gets stat bonuses. There's some side quests with more thought and character than this. Nothing fucking happens. Half of it is about killing a chocobo, and that plot felt more rewarding than the parts with Caius. So this is another one with a real dungeon, but this time it's a tall tower that you need to vertically scale, which also means that you can fall and redo half of it. Though so the enemies are typically in hordes, and the fights aren't terribly difficult, but you also have the added disadvantage of slowly losing a little bit of HP for as long as you're in the tower. Luckily, there's a shop right before it that lets you refill on healing items, so it's not brutal. And once you do make it to Caius, you unlock a little warp at the start to bring you back to the top so you can refill on items again. And you'll need it, because Caius is the hardest of the main quest boss fights. It might also be worth mentioning here in the final 11 minutes of the video that Lightning has a limited amount of healing items she can hold. I know I mentioned it in passing earlier, but every time you complete a main quest, the number increases, so at the start you can carry 5 items, while at the end you have 10. It's actually really annoying, and I feel like there's portions of the game that aren't balanced around this idea very well. But speaking of hard, unbalanced bullshit, let's talk about the final day. So once you've finished all of the main story quests, Day 13 is going to be unlocked for you. At this point you have the choice to either skip time like a dumbass, or complete as many side quests as possible to prepare for the final fight. I'd highly recommend the second option, because once Day 13 truly starts, you are stuck on a track to the final battle. This does have the added benefit of removing the clock, so you do have the ability to run from battles and take your time, but you're also stuck with whatever you have, with no way to improve aside from one little thing I'll get to in a bit. So story-wise, right before Day 13 begins, Begins, Lightning decides that she should think for herself, give Destiny the middle finger, and not follow God's plan. Now, boy gee golly, I wonder where the fuck I've heard this already. As a part of her new independent plan, she goes to the church to stop Vanille from performing the ceremony we talked about during Fang section. Vanille is under the belief that her death will lead to everyone being brought to the next world, so it's important that Lightning gets there fast. In the first room you go into, Lightning is ambushed by three chimeras, but who, look at that, here's Null here to save us. And there was much rejoicing. Then our next area is a series of forked hallways, and I'm guessing if you went down the extra forks you'd be rewarded some items, but I went the wrong way and got nothing. On the bright side, you get to meet back up with Fang, who is here to save her best buddy Vanille. Fang joins you up for two fights, and that leads to y'all destroying the Aussie killing box, but also Snow and Null come in to help because they're just so cool. The box is destroyed, the cult is sad, and Bunavelza reveals that he was using Hope's body as his vestal and all seeing eye to spy on lightning. Holy fuck, this is stupid. Okay, so there had been some hints towards this earlier, but it also doesn't explain how much of real hope we had. Was it Bunavelza the whole time? Did he swap out with Hope at day 10? Did he really need to turn Hope back into a teenager? I know this one sounds like nitpicking, but given how Hope is the character you interact with the most in this game, and he gifts you with this fucking outfit, I'd like to know who it really was. Either way, Lightning decides that she has to go fight Bunavelza alone, despite the fact that all her warrior friends are right fucking next to her. Yeah, so I'm a fucking jackass, I totally forgot that there was a part when Bunavelza dusted all of them Thanos style, so yeah, ignore that little comment right there. Although Noel was still safe. So now at this point the game gives you three options. You can immediately go fight Bunavelza, trek through four little areas with ultra difficult battles to receive the best sword and shield in the game. I'd highly recommend this since Mog is right here to sell more items in between each of them. Or you can touch this hourglass that takes you back to day one as New Game Plus. The last choice is meant as a last resort on the very, very high chance that you are too under level to defeat Bunavelza since there's no way to improve yourself on day 13. So this goes without saying, but the biggest drawback to choosing the hourglass is that you have to redo every single story quest. You do keep everything you had and can save time by skipping cutscenes, but you'll still have to repeat so many annoying bullshit parts of the game. You may think I'm making a really big deal of this, but let's talk about the Boon of Elza fight, because that fucking hourglass is about to sound as tempting as titty milk in a minute. So this is fate. 
Boon of Elza is the hardest final boss in any mainline FF game I've played. This fight consists of not one, not two, not three, fucking four phases. And the first of those phases casts Doom at you at the start of the fight. And for those of you uninformed, Doom is basically a little death counter. So once that runs out, you're fucking dead. So you can't take your sweet time with this guy. And then the second and third phases, they have instant death moves that are fucking impossible to stop. I read the guides, they say, oh, you gotta hit him a bunch. I hit him a bunch. I hit him over and over and over again. It does not end. Once he starts using that instant death move, just accept death. It's over. And on top of that, just about every time he hits you in the first three phases, he's gonna start a combo that will almost certainly put you down to maybe one third health if you're lucky. And then phase four over here. Now, he doesn't hit as hard and it's easy to block all of his attacks, but you do jack shit in terms of damage. If he's not staggered, which is a severe problem since his stagger meter resets faster than your high school boyfriend came in the back of his dad's El Camino, you do no fucking damage. So basically the biggest hurdle here is that you've got to defeat four phases of varying strategies with 12 attacks, three garbs, 10 items, and eight blocks on the TP gauge. I know some of you might be thinking, well no shit, it's one boss, but 13-1, whose final boss consisted of three phases, let you redo your party setup if you died to its second or third form, while letting you restart from whatever phase you were at. I just don't think it's out of possibility to request consistency in your trilogy. Either way, your main goal is to have almost all of your TP blocks unused at the start of phase four, because as I said, you gotta stagger them. And this is much easier said than done, since phases one through three all have reasons for you to end them as quickly as possible. Possible. Honestly, your best option, just completely fill up on Phoenix Downs, get fucking 10 of them, and just accept a few deaths during the first three phases while minimizing unblocked attacks. I don't have perfect advice for any of this, because the guides I looked at said I was actually doing it wrong, Whoa, whoops, oh. but I already missed my chance to get what I needed, so make sure y'all follow a guide for on like day 11 so you can be prepared. Only other thing I can say about this is be prepared to die a lot. Or you can just bitch out and use the hourglass so you can come back as an overpowered goliath. Whatever floats your scotch tape sealed boat, I guess. Once Boon of Elsa is finally defeated, you're treated to a scene where he, still possessing hope, falls into the abyss with lightning. At this point, we're at the ending, so the game decided to be as confusing as possible, and I'm probably gonna get a few things out of order, so just bear with me on it. So first, Lightning and Lumina have a pep talk where it's revealed that Lumina was actually Lightning's lost innocence or something. This wasn't really something any of the three games focused on, so I don't see why they felt the need to make it such a big deal here at the very end of the trilogy. After that talk, Hope comes in to rescue Lightning from the abyss, and they both get out to try and finish off Buna Velza, who, as far as it told us, was already dealt with. And I get the whole have the final boss take his last hit in a cutscene thing, but he doesn't even look weakened or anything here. It just, it just makes me feel a little cheated after the last fight was so difficult. And then the rest of the main cast, including Styrofoam, show up to help Lightning defeat Buna Velza as well. Except Zaz. But this brings back to question, why couldn't they have been there during the final boss? Besides the fact that the game's designed with only one guy, but Bucket. It just thematically doesn't make sense when during this scene, Lightning starts going off about the real superpower of T Spider Friend's doing jack shit most of the game, and the rest of it is sucking Lightning's clit. Anyways, at this point, Caius then appears to take down Buna Velza and bring Yule back to life, but yet again, doesn't explain how this works. So now, every soul, alive, dead, and maybe even those you didn't actually save, show up to meet Lightning to take everyone into the new world. Then the credits roll, followed by Lightning walking out of the train in a real-world Scotland-looking area wearing what I can only assume to be Louis Vuitton clothes, with no explanation. And that's how the game ends. To be nice, the whole ending scene looked cool, but it doesn't really say anything, and that's my main problem with all of Lightning Returns. As the 13th trilogy went on, their messages started to become less clear. 13-1 was obvious. Fate is a myth, forge your own path, will fuck up a lot, and also a little bit of anti-organized religion elements because it is an RPG. 13-1's characters focus more on themselves, since as we'll see, which you can look up with that as yourself, they didn't have a choice on taking part in the story. 13-2 bounces off of this by making the two protagonists' destinies purely wrapped around other people. While it did continue to shed light on the problem with Styrofoam's character, it also asked a question of how much you're willing to do for someone else. The answer was more interpretive, since while the main duo chose to follow their destiny, they still landed at a bad ending. It was a similar message to the first one, but a completely different outcome and situation. It also had a story along the lines of Sim! Don't use the time machine! Love Sim! Lightning Returns messages... fuck. 
I honestly wasn't quite sure, other than repeating a few lines from 13.1, and even then it's verbatim the same thing. Which makes me question, why does it need to be a separate game? Because of that confusion, I decided to do some wiki magic and hot dog did they really fuck up at what they wanted to say. First thing to note, I'm getting my information from the Final Fantasy Wikia in a page it sources to that dates to 2012, which would have been the start of the game's development. So take this with a grain of salt. One of the thematic goals of the game was to continue the story of Fighting Destiny. Okay, yeah, it was done worse than the past two games, but it's there. But then we have these two here the rebirth of lightning and showing that hope matured the lightning. Lightning Returns failed to achieve either of these things and it all comes back to things before the game even started. First let's go back to my question from earlier. Was this Hope? It's hinted that Boonavelza could have been in Hope's body the whole time, but if that's the case then this core theme is just completely gone right then and there. Now let's assume it was Hope until maybe day 12? Well then we have the problem that they turned him back into a fucking teenager. If you want a core theme to be about Hope's new maturity in front of lightning, then why not let him be an adult? You could have literally reused his model from 13-2. As well as both of those, Hope himself feels out of character because both of them had their emotions removed, which is the big problem with the Rebirth of Lightning idea as well. This makes me think that maybe Lumina and the idea that she is Lightning's lost innocence was planned to be a more central element of the game at some point. Given how Lightning has a responsibility weight in this game that rivals Spider-Man's, it would have made sense if Lumina was planned to play a bigger role with more hints towards her relation to Lightning other than looking like her sister. But instead, Lightning comes out of this game less interesting than she was in the original. So now we're here at the end with one question left. What was the purpose of the FNC as a whole? Over these three games, it's the exact same mythology and setting, but it's not unique like the connections between FF1 and 5 or the Ivalice Alliance. It's the same as the connections between Beautiful Joe and Beautiful Joe 2. They're the same because it's a sequel. It's not special. They do have a through-line message about fighting destiny, but again, that's not special. The Star Wars trilogy has a theme throughout about good versus evil. Even looking at it as the Lightning trilogy as people have dubbed it since LR, it doesn't work. Since, as stated earlier, they had to retcon the first game to make it work. So at the end of the day, would I call the 13 trilogy a good experience? Not really. As many people before me have stated, 13.1 isn't even a holy grail or anything. It has so many gameplay problems that it's hard to get through, and yeah, the story's great, but then both of the sequels have just such broken mess of stories. And I had a really enjoyable time playing 13.2. I want to recommend it so much, but you're not going to get the full experience unless you play the game before and after it. And in all honesty, this is really just my own opinion. If you feel differently, you can tell me in the comments, you can write me on Twitter, send me something to my actual home address if you can find it, but you know, this is a pretty long thing. I'm, I'm kind of tired. I don't know how to end this. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching. So this is the first thing I've done in a really long time. I know there's a few rough spots on the edges. Um, all of my older things I don't want to link. There's a, this, a few stupid meme videos on my channel you can look at. They're not that good. Um, I do have more things in the woodwork that are going to come somewhat soon. Uh, this one took me a while to make, about a month and a half. So fucking big. I'm not. Whatever I do next isn't going to be this long. It's going to be like somewhere between 9 and 20 minutes. It's not going to reach more than 20 minutes. That's that's the goal. Uh, I don't want to drag this on. I might eventually do Type-0. It depends on my opinion on the game. I haven't beaten it, is the thing. I'm just rambling. This is going to end. I'm going to like cut myself. Just so fucking stuck.